So my talk is uh, about the use of international treaties um, concluded by a number, but not all EU member states in the context of the sovereign debt crisis outside, formally speaking, the EU legal order. And, and, um, and when listening to Stefano Bertolini's uh, introduction, when he said um, a crisis is the situation where the rules can no longer be followed to solve the problem, I thought, okay, so perhaps this is what's going on here. So the rules, the existing rules haven't been followed, or have they, have they been? So that's a question, actually. So from a legal perspective, what you see here with the use of international treaties can be interpreted actually in different ways. You could say the rules have been changed, okay? So the existing rules were not enough to, to deal with the uh, crisis, so the rules have been changed. Some people would say the rules have been breached, okay? So there have been breaches of EU law in this uh, uh, context, and some people will argue that uh, later on in the, in the conference. And the third option is to say, which would be my preferred option, to see uh, that what we've, what we've had here is what Adrienne called interstitial institutional change. And what lawyers might uh, call um, rather um, legal interpretation, creative legal interpretation <laughs> by the institutions. And I hear some people laughing, but it's not, it's not a matter for, for laughing. I think that's what happens, in fact, all the time. So what is called in interstitial institutional change is legal interpretation by the institutions helped with by, by the legal services. And it, it might often be on the margins of what is legally permissible, sometimes go beyond the, uh, the margins, um, but that's the task that they set themselves to do. And that's what happened, I think, here with these phenomena, um, namely three treaties uh, to deal, that have been concluded to deal with the Euro crisis. And I put the term treaties between inverted brackets. And the reason is that the first of those hasn't been called a treaty. It's not called a treaty. There's a decision of the representatives of the governments of the Euro area countries to set up the EFSF. And the EFSF, as you know, is still, as we speak, the main instrument used to, to give um, financial support, budgetary, uh, financial support to, to uh, the main crisis countries. What happened actually on the, the 9th of May, the decision was published on the 10th of May, but was taken on the 9th of May, is something which illustrates what, what is going on here. We had a normal meeting of the Council, of the ECOFIN Council, in which certain decisions were taken dealing with the Euro crisis. And after some coffee break, I suppose, 17 members of that council reconvened, but this time as representatives of their governments, okay? So there was hat switching, a phenomenon which you see all the time here. The same people, physical persons, instead of being members of the council, become representatives of their governments and conclude an international agreement outside the EU legal order. Although physically they're still inside a building of the European Union, formally they step outside the EU legal uh, framework. And that's what they did with this decision. Now that decision was itself not enough to create the EFSF, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we have two real treaties, two genuine treaties. One, the the treaty establishing the European Stability Mechanism, which is now taking over gradually from the EFSF, as you know. It entered into force a month ago. And then the famous Fiscal Compact with the long name, Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance in the Economic and Monetary Union, which is going most probably to enter into force on the 1st of January 2013. So we've all heard of those three uh, instruments, of course. Two of them are about crisis management, dealing with the crisis by giving financial support. The third one is about crisis prevention. It's one of the many instruments alongside the six pack and other things which have been put in place to try to prevent the same thing to happen in the future. Now this phenomenon that suddenly governments or some governments at least step outside the EU framework and conclude a treaty alongside the EU framework has seemed shocking to many people. But if you look at it from a different perspective, you can say it's an existing and you could say almost normal instrument of cooperation, of European cooperation. Inter se agreements, that is to say agreements between not all EU member states have always existed in the history of European integration. There's many examples of that and some of them are really very close to the subject matter 
of the European Union itself. I mentioned here the examples of the Schengen agreements, the Benelux Treaty, Euro control, all these things deal with matters which are very close to the matters uh, the European Union is dealing, but they have been dealt with at some stage at least with Schengen through separate international treaties. Now the legal starting point is undisputed, and that is the starting point is the primacy of EU law over such separate international agreements. They can only be concluded if their content is compatible with existing EU law and if they respect, of course, the rights of non-participating EU countries. That is undisputed. Nobody challenges that rule. The, the disputes about are about the interpretation and application of that rule. Now, of course, the making a separate international agreement has an advantage for governments, and the advantage is that they can make a deal between themselves, okay? They're not constrained by EU decision-making rules. They don't have to negotiate endlessly as they did for the six-pack with the Commission and the European Parliament, they can make a deal between themselves. But a disadvantage, and it's also a disadvantage for the governments themselves, I would argue, is that the legal qualities of EU law disappear. The legal qualities of EU law, which involve things such as democratic participation, the role of the Parliament, effective compliance mechanism, that if you would, uh, agree a rule, it is also going to stick. These things are things which governments on the whole like about EU law, okay? So they don't dislike it uh, in general, but occasionally what you see is that they leave that system and they go outside and conclude a treaty between themselves. Now, it had seemed for a long time, or in, in, in the recent decades, that this was declining, this phenomenon. And one indicator of this decline is, of course, the um, invention, you could say, of intra-EU enhanced cooperation uh, in the Treaty of Amsterdam and then being um, modified a few times and now being used, actually. So we now have seen the first actual uses of that mechanism, which, of course, allows for the use of EU law. It allows for the use of EU institutional decision-making rules, the result is EU law, which is enforceable, but it is between only some member states. It's enhanced cooperation inside. And of course, the whole idea of this was to preclude the need for agreements outside the European Union by some countries. It was uh, decided at the time of Amsterdam in order to prevent things like the Schengen treaties to happen again in the future. There would be no need for that anymore if you could do the same thing inside the EU framework. Now, despite that, the member states, uh, and that's a very trivial thing that I'm saying here, remain states, okay? And states have the capacity to make international treaties. And they use that capacity all the time. We know that usually with other countries, with third countries, but they can also use it to make treaties between themselves when <laughs> necessary. And in the Euro crisis, it has appeared necessary. Now, there's two ways of looking at this phenomenon, I think. You can look at it as a way of undermining the EU legal order, the negative perspective. Or you could look at it from a more positive perspective and say, there are simply additional instruments of European cooperation, additional instruments in the toolbox of European cooperation that can be used whenever useful to advance the process of European integration. And then that is, of course, a much more positive view. So what I want to do in the remaining uh, minutes is to look briefly at the reasons why those international treaties have been concluded and at the consequences of them in legal political terms. Now looking at the reasons, here is my um, position that I would like to, to advance here. My position is that we don't see here a strategic intergovernmental plot against the community method. I don't see the evidence of that. It's true that we have intergovernmental mechanisms being put in place here, but they're not part of an overall strategy. Rather, I would argue that each of the three has been concluded for contingent reasons that have to be looked at separately for each of those three instruments, and that's what I, I'm going to do now uh, quickly. Now, if we start with the first one, the EFSF. First of all, it's um, an from a legal perspective, it's a very complex construction because the EFSF has been launched by the addition of four stages, actually. Things that happened in very close uh, succession. 
first was this decision which I already mentioned. This, this is the international agreement between 17 countries saying we are going to set up this facility. So that's the basic, if you want, political agreement, but it took a legal form. Immediately after that, the facility itself was established as a private company, as, as you know. A private company under Luxembourg law, but a very strange company because the shareholders are not private persons, but 17 states, okay? 17 euro countries became the exclusive shareholders of the facility. Immediately after that, the facility itself, so that company, concluded a framework agreement, again, a private law agreement under English law this time, with its shareholders, which again is a very unusual thing in private law. Companies concluding uh, uh, contracts with their shareholders, it's, it's unheard of. And what happens in that framework agreement is that there you find the rules of governance, how the facility is going to operate, how it's going to take its decisions. And if you look at that, it's quite clear, of course, it's run like an international organization. And then the, first, the fourth step, the implementation then is to bring in the money, of course. Where does the money come from? Well, the money comes from a number of separate, 17 separate national law measures. So each country had to organize itself under its own national law to provide the funding for EFSF. So very complicated. And what you see here is something that in reality is an international organization, but that takes a legal form of a private company. Now why? Why this very complicated construction? Why these arrangements? Well, I think, first of all, this seemed more efficient than what had been attempted first, namely a series of bilateral agreements between 16 euro countries and Greece. That had been the first um, instrument, but grouping it all together in one, one system seemed more efficient. The EU budget could not provide for the financial support. I think that's the fundamental point here. There was also a stability mechanism set up under EU law at the same time, which was given 60 billion euros, and that was the maximum available under the EU budget, because you know that the budget is very small. There's no room for maneuver there. Since they needed at that time much more money, a much bigger firewall, the only option, in my view, was to set up a separate international arrangement outside the EU using the money of the member states. Now, why was it not done in the form of a proper international treaty? There the reason is simply urgency and emergency. If you conclude a proper international treaty, you have first to sign it, and then get it ratified by all the member states. There was simply no time for that in May 2010. It had to happen very, very quickly, and therefore they, they chose this very strange legal construction which I described in the previous slide and which I would call a form of emergency into governmentalism. Now, if you then look at its successor, the ESM Treaty, that's a proper treaty, of course, which was prepared for a long time, and its preparation uh, happened at first, in fact, in, in March 2011, through an amendment of the TFEU, which is going to enter into force, in principle, also on the 1st of January of next year. That amendment introduces one sentence in Article 136, TFEU that allows the euro area countries to set up a permanent financial stability mechanism to replace the EFSF. Um, two treaties have been concluded, actually, on that basis. There's been a first ESM treaty concluded in June 2011 and a second one in February. And that's one of the interesting things of international law, of course, because under international law, states can conclude a treaty and sign it to say, we agree with the content of that treaty, but then it has to be ratified. And that leaves time for second thoughts, and that's what happened. Immediately after they concluded the first ESM treaty, they said, oh, we need to give extra powers to the ESM to deal more efficiently with the, with the crisis. And they said, okay, we will stop. We we're not going to ratify this treaty. We forget about it. It's still there somewhere. It's legally existent but it has, is never going to enter into force. Instead, they concluded a second treaty in February 2012, which is, has now entered into force. <coughs> so here we have a proper international organization with its own organs. But if you look at the organs, the Board of Governance and the Board of Directors, it's again hat switching that is going 
on here. The people who actually sit there are the same people who sit in the ECOFIN Council, the ministers, they, they are the members of the Board of Governors, and they're the members of the Euro Working Group in the EU. So the, the high civil servants of the member states, of the 70 member states, sit in this EU body, and they are the same ones who will be in the Board of Directors of the ESM. So it's very close. It's a separate satellite international organization, but very closely linked to the EU institutional framework. Why? Why the ESM treaty? Well, that's obvious, because the amendment of Article 136 said the member states can create this financial support mechanism, not the EU. And therefore, it was logical that it happened through an international treaty. But why? Why was this addressed to the member states and not to the EU, this permission to create a financial support mechanism? Well, here I would argue that there's been path dependency with the EFSF. So the, the ESM took the place of the facility and it was organized along the same uh, lines and for the same reasons, okay? The same reason, namely the insufficiency of the EU budget is still there when the ESM treaty is being established. The ESM needed lots of money. I keep forgetting how, how many billions it is, but it's an incredible amount of money which is simply not available in the EU budget. It has to come from the member state budgets, even though hopefully they're not going to lose the money because it's just lending it, but still, the availability has to be there. So that's the reason why this was again an international treaty. It had a, a, a by another sort of advantage for the states, namely that the fact that no new competences were given here to the EU allowed to use the simplified revision of the TFEU. So not a proper intergovernmental conference and convention, which you would need to give new competences to EU institutions, but a more a slightly more simplified revision mechanism through European Council decision. So here we have indeed deliberate intergovernmentalism because this was long prepared, this, this ESM treaty, but it followed a path which had already been taken before to go outside the EU framework, and I think for good reasons, because the, the EU doesn't have the financial means to, to, to deal with this problem. And then finally, the fiscal compact, the third of in the series. This is, of course, a very different instrument. It's, it's not creating a separate international organization, okay? unlike the ESM treaty. It's a classical treaty concluding obligations for the contracting parties. And these obligations are essentially about harmonizing, as we know, their national budgetary laws. So no new bodies, practically no separate international organization. And the idea expressed in the last article of the treaty is that this, the content of the fiscal compact will be integrated within a couple of years into the EU legal order as happened with the Schengen treaty. So that's the model which is being followed here. So member states, in this case 25 member states, step outside the EU institutional <laughs> framework, conclude a separate agreement and, but with the intention of bringing back, eventually, the content of that treaty within EU law. So why did they break out? Well, that's a story we know about, I think. The original idea was not to have a separate international treaty. The original idea was to amend the TFEU, to introduce those rules into primary EU law. It didn't happen because you need unanimity for that, and the United Kingdom, as we know, vetoed revision of the TFEU at the Council, European Council meeting of December 2011. And the other countries, during the summit already, immediately decided, okay, if that's the case, if you stop us from introducing those reforms we want, we're going to make them outside the EU framework through a separate international treaty. So there was an immediate exiting from the EU framework, which was perhaps too immediate, because the alternative option would have been, that in fact, to achieve much of the content of the fiscal compact through secondary EU law, through further regulations and directives, possibly with enhanced cooperation. So that option existed in this case. So in this case, I would say EU law could have been used instead of a separate international agreement, but they decided too, quick, too quickly, in, if you want, to go outside. So I would call this accidental intergovernmentalism <laughs> rather than deliberate. So my conclusion on the reasons for those treaties is, again, as I said before, I don't see a preconceived plan here 
to sideline the community method or to, to, to sideline the EU uh, institutional balance. I don't see evidence of a deliberate strategy, but an incremental uh, activity, separate reasons for each of the three uh, instruments, why um, international law was uh, used. So I'm, I think I'm running out of time, but let me just add a f for a couple of minutes something on consequences. What does it mean now that the, a number of member states have gone outside the system and, and adopted these three treaties? Well, logically, it means two things. They opt into a new system, which is the international law of treaties, and they opt out of the EU legal order. And I'll say a few things about both. So opting into public international law, what does it involve? It involves, first of all, a new freedom. You, cr you, are, you enter a new world because in international law you can conclude treaties with whoever you want. Okay? Now in this case, of course, the choice of participants was determined to a large extent by the fact that you needed all the Euro countries. But certainly there is an element here of free choice of participants. You don't have to deal with all your awkward partners, <laughs> which you normally have to do in, inside the European Union. Another typical feature that you see by opting into international law is this signature ratification consequence, uh, sec sequence. Sorry. So you can achieve quick first results if you negotiate quickly a treaty and sign it, and that happened with the fiscal compact. It was negotiated in two months' time. But then it has to be ratified by all the member states uh, or all the contracting parties of that treaty. And that leads to a time lag and also a factor of uncertainty and there are still pending legal challenges of the ESM Treaty, including a challenge before the European Court of Justice. But I think this issue of ratification will be dealt with in, in the next panel, so I'm not uh, going into this. Um, the advantage of international law, of international treaties, is as also that its entry into force is flexible. So when drafting the treaty, you can provide for separate rules on its entry into force. And they've done that here, of course. With the fiscal compact, they've said it's enough if 12 Euro countries actually ratify this treaty for it to enter into force. And similarly, for the ESM treaty, no unanimity was required. And since we know the difficulties of getting unanimous ratification of European treaties, this is a major advantage of the, the uh, international law route. Now, stepping out of EU law has also consequences. Um, First of all, it has institutional consequences, obviously. I'm not dwelling on that because we will have lots of opportunities to discuss that. What you see here, of course, is that EU decision-making, so this very sophisticated institutional balance of the European Union and also the possibility of judicial control by the Court of Justice are essentially bypassed, okay? They don't apply. We are outside it. If you still want to use the EU institutions, and the governments want that to a large extent, you have to provide for it separately under your international treaty, and it may be tricky. Which leads me to the legal uh, conditionality. All this has to happen in compliance with EU law, and there's four major questions that have been asked in this respect. Legal questions, legal constitutional questions. Do member states have the, still the competence to act outside the EU. Some people have said this is about monetary policy and monetary policy is an exclusive EU competence, at least for the Euro countries, so they're not allowed to take action outside. That's one argument. The second argument has been to, s to say that the stability mechanism is in breach of the no bailout clause, because here you allow member states to financially support each other, which the no bailout clause, which is in the treaty, uh, wants to prevent. Thirdly, it has been said, well, fiscal compacts content is really m many of the things that are already in secondary EU law. So it's a duplication and modification of existing EU law. That shouldn't happen. And finally, you cannot borrow the EU institutions as you want because the, the, the competences of the EU institutions are defined by the European treaties, the basic treaties. So you cannot, states cannot add to that through a separate instrument. I don't have time to deal with them, but... Uh, <laughs> My position, and some of the answers will be given in this Pringle case, which is before the Court of Justice, but my answer, just I will just give you the answer. I will say, yes, the member states have that competence to act here. No, the ESM does not breach the Nobel Out Clause. It's meant to be a derogation from it, actually. Uh, the fiscal compact can indeed du duplicate and modify primary and secondary EU law, and the EU institutions can be borrowed. 
So my answer is to say that from a legal perspective, what has happened here is permissible. But some people have very different views on that, and these things are being discussed, as I said, before the Court of Justice. So final word, I would say that what has happened here is limited damage to the EU legal order. Um, member states have chosen to go outside for, for various reasons, which are defensible, I think, in this particular case. I don't see a plot. I don't see yet the beginning of a sort of major shift away outside the EU to create separate international treaties, but it may happen. It may happen in the future. So far what has happened, you could say, is that international law has been used to repair the damage caused by EU law, namely by the, the way EU law has been set up under the Maastricht Treaty with this imbalance between monetary and economic policy. Thank you.